speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big time personal brand, and become the go to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here is your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the show. This is Jason Hartman, your host, and every 10th episode, we do something kind of special, kind of different. What we do is we go off topic. So regardless of which show it is on the Hartman Media Network, whether it be one of the financial shows, economics, real estate investing, travel, longevity, all of the other topics that we have, every 10th episode, we go off topic and we explore something of general interest something of general life success value and so many of our listeners around the world in 164 countries have absolutely loved our 10th episode shows so that's what we're going to do today and let's go ahead and get to our guest with a special 10th episode show and of course on the next episode we'll be back to our regular programming here we go it's my pleasure to welcome David Osborne. He's co-founder and chairman of Magnify Capital and best-selling author of a few books, including Wealth Can't Wait, Avoid the Seven Wealth Traps. David, how you doing? It's great to be with you, Jason. Good to have you. Forgive me, I'm losing my voice here a bit, but I uh, can't wait to dive in. And uh, this book took you a long time to write, didn't it? You know, it was the hardest thing I've ever done, man. It, everyone has this idea like, hey, I'm going to write a book. And it took me seven years to write it. It was way harder than I thought it would be. And I think a lot of people find that I was stubborn. I didn't want to use a ghostwriter. I wanted to write it myself. And that's why it took seven years. Sure, sure. Well, tell us a little bit about some of the principles uh, and those wealth traps. Yeah, sure. So look, I mean, building wealth is mainly a choice. That's what we start off the premise with the book. It's just a choice. Like if you decide to be skinny or healthy, it's a choice also, right? So once you've made the choice, then you have to follow through with the actions. But if you don't make the choice, it's irrelevant. And it's okay not to be wealthy if you don't want to be. But if you wanted to be skinny, what would you do? Well, everyone knows what to do. You would eat vegetables, you would exercise, you wouldn't eat too much sugar, you wouldn't drink too much alcohol, right? So that's kind of the process. Make sure you get some cardiovascular, lift some weights. Well, wealth is the same thing, right? And we start with the basic concepts, and then we accelerate pretty fast into more sophisticated concepts. But the first section of the book is avoid the wealth traps. One of the wealth traps, for instance, is the cushy job trap. You got a good job. It's paying you 150, 280, whatever's comfortable for you a year. And you're like, yeah, I've got this business idea. Maybe I'll start it someday, but just not today. And that's called the cushy job trap. The other uh, trap that I think people should be very aware of, and there's seven in the book, but I don't want to go through them all, is the toxic people trap, right? So if you have people around you, and no one said that your high school friends have to be your friends for life. They could be, but if your goal is to elevate your life and your friends are like, oh, that's impossible. You could never get that done. Let's go have a drink and look at pretty women or something. Well, that's you know a friendship that's probably not going to financial freedom or financial success if that's the mainstay of the friendship. So then it's okay to move along from people. Your high school friends are not necessarily your destiny. And so that's the toxic relationship trap that people fall into as well that sure. keeps them small. Yeah, so then from there, it's, it's like live below your means, save some money. Because, you know, capitalism is all about capital. You have to save up some capital. You either have to use your capital or somebody else's capital. And then we get into more sophisticated concepts like other people's money. People always think, well, I don't have any money. How can I do a deal? But there's always money for deals. So if you learn how to find deals that are great for people, you'll always find the capital. And so, you know, there's just this whole process we go through in the book of taking you from sort of day one beginner, don't know anything, which mostly is about mindset. People are always like, oh, mindset, that's so airy-fairy. But the reality is if you're not mentally prepared to be wealthy, you won't be wealthy because money has problems too. There's two kinds of problems, not enough money and too much money. And don't think that having a lot of money is suddenly easy, which yeah. is why lottery winners blow it all or football players. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, I grew up without money. Now I have lots of it. And man, I don't know. It's not all it's I thought it would be. I'll put it that way. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of work. It's Jason. a lot of work. Yeah. Sorry for us, but yeah. it's a lot of management, a lot of you know oversight, a lot of legal, uh, yeah. a lot of complexity. So you got to be prepared for that, and you're not going to find that if you're spending your time watching every football game that ever comes out every weekend and drinking beer every night, right? So, yeah. and then it's learning how to find the deals, analyze the deals, reading the books, uh, tuning into the information. 
And then it's learning how to build a killer team and then how to leverage your success through others. The other thing about building wealth that's interesting is all the skills that get you to the entry level, the doorway of wealth or the beginning levels hinder you to get to higher levels. And what I mean by that is the way you'll start off your wealth building journey through income producing properties, which I know is your mantra. And I love it because I think real estate is the greatest place in the world for the everyday man to build wealth. But when you get one property, well, how do you do a good deal? Well, you, you find it, you do a lot of work, you analyze it, maybe you put sweat equity into it by doing the repairs yourself, you manage it yourself, you do all these frugal things that help you have a killer deal. Well, that behavior will enable you to get to 10 or 15 properties. It won't get you to 100. So once you get to a certain level of success, maybe five or six or seven, you have to learn to leverage other people's skills. So hire out the management, hire out the repairs so you can go to do what you do best which is seeking those great deals and putting them into your portfolio. You know, it's an interesting journey building wealth. It's super fun because you have to constantly sharpen the saw, but those are kind of some of the basics the books talks about. Yeah, absolutely. That's good stuff. So let's dive deeper into some of the more sophisticated techniques. And well, before we do that, I wanted to mention you are so right about the mindset part of it. You know, my mentors years ago at age 17 were Jim Rohn, Dennis Whaley, Earl Nightingale, and Zig Ziglar. And it seems like nowadays there's just not enough on the mindset, the philosophy. Nowadays, everything seems like how to, right? So I'm glad that you address that mindset stuff because it's not airy fairy. It's critical to have some principles to have a philosophy. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And you mentioned Jim Rohn, who's my absolute all time favorite. And for 49 bucks, you can buy online like his magnificent life or whatever. It's ridiculously cheap. And if you just listen to that, like I did probably 20 times, you'll have the principles of success embedded in you. And I think the reason Jason, the wealthy keep getting wealthier is once you've embedded those success principles in you, and people know them. They're, they're, they, they sound trite, but it's like you learn or you win. So if you don't win, you learn. So therefore, you're always winning, right? Things like this become second nature to you when you embed it in your soul. And then the other person who has a loss and then complains about it and falls into victim mode, maybe justifiably so. Maybe they were treated poorly, but they end up stuck for two years in this rut of self-pity. Whereas if you've learned what Jim would say, you know, you live or you learn. So you got kicked in the teeth. You figure out why. Maybe you picked the wrong partner. Maybe you put yourself in the wrong situation. There's always something you did that you can own that. So you drop it, you give yourself a five minute pity party, and then you move on and you go back to work and you start winning more, which is why I think the wealth inequality, which I think is a bad thing, happens so extremely in life. Because when I hang around with people like yourself that get it and know how to go after it, they just keep winning and then it becomes second nature to them. And it's not like a sports career where you got eight years. If you really get good at wealth building, you've got a 30, 40, 50 year career. So of course, the disparities get bigger and bigger. Right, right. I think to a lot of the dreamers, it looks, I guess it looks easy on the outside. But believe me, there are a million pieces of, you know, shrapnel along the way. (laughs) I mean, it's just unbelievable the number of hits that you take, but you just got to keep going. Like, what else is there to do? What else would you do? Just give up? Well, I mean, life's, you know what? Life's going to be painful anyway, whether you win or lose. Exactly. Life's painful if you lose. Yeah. Sitting around feeling bad for yourself and doing nothing all day, that hurts too. Getting overweight because you drink too much or don't look after your body. And that also is is painful. So life's going to have pain. The thing about success is, yes, people think it looks easy and effortless, but actually you get kicked hard in the teeth multiple times and you're sitting there picking up your teeth, trying to figure out how to put them back in your mouth and going back to work. But again, like I said, I don't think life's going to be hard. That's almost a given. So why not reinforce yourself and strengthen yourself and learn from it? And then it becomes addictively fun to keep learning and say, you know, somebody drops a big lawsuit on you that you know is frivolous. You're like, wow, can I just keep going through my life and ignore this frivolous lawsuit and be happy? And the answer becomes yes on the fourth or fifth one on the first or second one. It's, it, you'll obsess about it. You'll stay up late. You won't sleep. And then eventually you realize part of the cost of doing business and being successful is somebody's going to try to take an unfair advantage of you. And you learn to live without it. You know, you compartmentalize it. I, I always say you spend the first half of your career creating wealth and you spend, you spend the second half protecting it because as soon as yep. you get big, you become a target and there yep. are all these greedy people, sleazy people that'll just start attacking your wealth and you've got to learn to deal with that. And a buddy of mine was telling me uh, uh, sometime last year, he's a really successful guy. He's just done incredible things in his career and um, he's now about 52 years 
years old, I think. And he was saying, you know, I remember I had this frivolous lawsuit years ago. I could have easily settled it. And he said, but I wanted to have the experience of litigating it to see what it was like. So I would know when a real lawsuit that mattered came along. And he said, I spent a bunch of money on it, but I learned so much, you know, <laughs> like I know how it works. Yeah. And I thought, you know, that's a very interesting philosophy you have, but I, I can see the point. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I did a similar thing. I fought one tooth and nail all the way to the end, and I'm still willing to fight him. But, you know, the main thing I learned from fighting him is if there's a faster way out, that's probably the better way to go. But I yeah. have fought some tooth and nail. I've fought some for years and years that have just languished and lingered. And then eventually the people get wisdom. And But fighting a lawsuit is a beating. It's just a whole nother career with no upside, really. Right, right. No, it isn't. But I will tell you one thing about the litigation paradigm that's interesting is that people always, you know, when they're, when they're in a dispute, they always complain, oh, it's so expensive. The lawyers are so expensive. And, you know, that's all true, right? But what few people look at is that when you litigate something, you actually get, there are three parties, right? There are the two adversaries, and then there's the court system. So all that infrastructure. And you right. get those two other parties for free. You don't pay for them, assuming you don't lose and have to pay their legal fees or something, right? But you get yep. them for free. So you get all of that learning of all of that effort of all three parties, and you're only paying for one third. It's sort of not as bad as people think. No, I agree. I mean, I'm, I have a real estate company that has 5,000 agents. We're probably in 10 to 15 lawsuits at any moment in time from the transactions. And so you're right. It isn't as bad. It, the first ones are tough, but later on it becomes, I mean, I remember reading an article about Richard Branson. He said, I'm in 300 lawsuits at any moment in time. Yeah. I'm like, oh, well, yeah. that's, you just have to learn with, to live with it. And it is interesting. It's just another part of the business. Right. I had right. another interesting yeah. experience one time where I was being sued and finally we got to depositions and we're a hundred grand ended each. I'm sure they were. I know I was in defense, legal fees, like 18 months were finally in the de deposition. I read theirs and I'm like, you know, it's not that far off what happened. The only difference is between where they are and where I am is that I thought they were failing. So I took over the business because they were failing and we were losing money. And in their mind, they weren't failing. They were just about to turn a corner. So in reality, like I'm thinking, like, how would an impartial judge look at this? They'd say, well, I see both sides. That's exactly what they would see. So I immediately settled in that case. I was like, you know what? This is when I was younger and more hot-headed and more stubborn. Right now, the frivolous ones, I'm happy to fight just all the way to the all the way to the end if I have to. So, yeah, but that it, one in particular, you begin to realize there's a lot of nuances in life, and just because you think you're right doesn't mean you always are. Right, right. I, I had this friend who had a uh, a real estate fund. Well, I mean, I'm still friends with him, and I remember he was looking for other places to live and move out of the country because he he got sued one time, and he thought, you know, he was on this big rant about oh, the U.S. is so ridiculous, it's so litigious, you know, it's just not fair, blah, blah, blah. And he's having this whole conversation that here, literally, he's going to uproot his wife and kid and move them out of the country just simply because he's Crazy. fed up with the litigation. Crazy. I mean, it's just the cost of doing business. Get over it. Exactly. It's not a big deal. You just there's so to, many opportunities. There's a lot of ways. Yeah. There's ways to protect your wealth, and then you have to be willing to, if you're going to engage, you have to be willing to fight the battle. So it's just part of the deal. It's just part of the deal. Yeah, it's no big deal. All right. So any of the more sophisticated components uh, uh, that you wanted to mention? You know, really the importance of hiring great people and figuring out, we go into the book, how to be in business with great people, how to not be in the business with the people that are going to sue you, how to find the, because winners tend to keep winning. So if you can surround yourself with winners, if you can be in business with winners, if you can hire winners, and we go into some of the more complex strategies on that. And one of them is that just because you like someone doesn't mean you should hire them. Most people sort of just hire based on, oh, it seems like a nice guy, I'll hire him. Mm -hmm. And we teach uh, a, a more deeper process of sort of really uncovering their history of their career. Because if, you, if you're hiring somebody and you really like them, and, and in the interview, they're like, my last boss was a jerk. And then my boss before that was a jerk. You can guarantee that in a they're year, a you'll be the jerk. Yeah, That's right. just the way exactly. it happens. Exactly. Yeah, right. So yeah. people's habits repeat themselves. Right, right. That's one of the keys. And there's and then the other ones, you know, like you've got the only way you find deals is to look at a thousand, you know, a hundred deals to find one. Uh, we talk about the opportunity matrix in the book and the opportunity matrix is every deal has people and a deal involved. And you start with the people. And if you don't like the people, if they're not ethical, it doesn't matter how great the deal is. You just don't do it. You walk away. The people are far more important 
than the opportunity. I'd rather do a decent opportunity with great people than an incredible opportunity with bad people. I'm so glad end I'm up so, being who David, they are. I'm so glad you said that. And I say that all the time. We'd rather recommend our clients invest in a B market where we have an A team of trustworthy people than an A yep. market with a B team because the people will always damage your plans more than the marketplace will. That's correct. Yeah, That's yeah. wise. Very, very interesting. And then, and then to look for the downside, people tend to get really excited. We call it opium, and they really only measure the upside. So, mm-hmm. you know, that's why all performers are BS, right? So somebody will say to you, this is what's going to happen. It's going to be like this. It's going to be amazing. You as a good investor need to be looking for what could go wrong. What's the worst thing that could happen here? And if the worst thing that could happen is you get your money back, that's not such a bad thing. But if the worst thing is you could go to zero, that is a bad thing because Warren Buffett's rule number one is to protect the capital and rule number two is rule number one. So you want to try to never lose capital. Real estate gives you that opportunity. But one thing I see people making the mistake of over and over again is they get too optimistic and too full of hope about the deals they see and they don't do enough due diligence into the potential downside. Yeah, absolutely. So when you learn that downside, I mean, I like the saying, expect the best, prepare for the worst. But what do you do with that learning, right? Say you're looking at this deal and it looks great with the hopium attitude, right? But there is some real downside risk. How do you decide what you should do? Do you move forward or not? Well, I'm a cynical optimist. You know, that's a, another way of looking at it. I try to be a cynical optimist. In other words, I'm happy and I'm looking for the positive, but I'm trying to tear down what could go wrong. For me, it's sort of a, if we're 50% levered, what's the likelihood that I would lose 100% of my capital? And if it's low and maybe I could lose 30% worst case, then I'm more interested in a deal let's say that has a 15% annual upside. Well, I'm more interested in that than a deal that has a 150% annual upside, but has the potential of losing 100% of my capital. Because what I find as I've gotten further into this, the longer I've been in business, that it's base hits really are the, the way to go. And trying to hit a home run is actually usually a mistake because you can hit two home runs and then have one complete loss and it erases the gain of both of those home runs. So really just go I want to be the Ichiro Suzuki of real estate and just get rack up the base hits for 30 or 40 or 50 years. And you'll never see me having to worry about money again. So I think that's really it. If it looks too good to be true, it almost always is. Almost every deal I've gone into with a great enthusiasm, excitement about how I was going to 10x or 5x my money has either turned into a zero or at best maybe a two or three X. And there's usually nine zeros for every one, two or three X. So it, just don't buy the hope. It, it's so sad that you see so many people chasing that incredible deal, you know, waiting for their ship to come in. And in the meantime, they could have had, you know, six base hits, right? Six base hits yep. means two of your players came in and scored, right? They came yep. past home. Yep. So yeah, absolutely. Rack up the base hits. Very good philosophy. Give us your outlook on the real estate market, if you would, and just talk about income property for a moment. And then I want to ask you about just morning routines, Miracle Morning Millionaires, your other book, quickly sure. before you go. I think the market is now, uh, you have to be more aware. Like anything you bought in 12, 13, 14, 15, you won on. That was like, it was the best time of my life for buying real estate. But uh, but we but didn't know it a, then, just so you know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I bought a lot, but it was terrifying. I bought a ton, but I started in 11. I dipped my toe in. Actually, I started in nine, went a little bit heavier in 10. And then at the end of 11, I was like, man, we need to buy everything we possibly can. Right. However, I agree with you. It was terrifying. I make it sound confident then, but I was scared. You know. But we were getting 15% cash on cash. It was crazy. Yeah. Buying homes for 50 that rented for 800 bucks a month, buying debt on assets that was severely undervalued at the time. But yes, you're right. It was terrifying. One should never forget the feeling you have of buying. Sure. Um, you, you, that, that's why you can't time I, the market because you never know where the top or the bottom is. I mean, correct. it was scary that's buying correct. back then, but it turned out to be incredible, but, of course. But there is a time to accelerate and decelerate. So now as I think a time to decelerate, you should still be doing deals. There are always deals out there. You should just be looking at 10 to maybe offer on one versus in 2013, looking at 10 to offer on five. Do you think that there's still a housing shortage, though? We were profiling experts that think that there's about a three to 600,000 unit per year housing shortage. I absolutely think there is, especially at the lower end. I mean, there's yeah. just no low-income there's housing. Nothing. And that's where I live. I'm a C-class guy, so I'm right. buying 
120, 130 how the thousand dollar homes. And I think there's a huge shortage of those kinds of homes in the U.S. Now, remembering that the U.S. is not one big equity, right? It's a thousand little equities. And so every market is slightly different. You got to know your markets, know your neighborhoods even. But I still think the lower end homes have a long way to run. And with rates as low as they are, you can buy, you know, an 8% yielding of return, an eight cap home and put, you know, 5% money on it and go to sleep on it. In 30 years, the tenant will have paid the property off for you and you'll just have another good base hit. So I think there's plenty of deals out there. I just think you have to be more selective, more careful, be fully educated and informed and play the game more cautiously. It's pretty amazing. It really is. And, you know, like Warren Buffett says, don't expect the deal to be good the day you buy it. They almost always are good in the rearview mirror. Just buy good quality stuff that makes sense, that's not speculative, and hang on to it, and you'll be fine. Listen to your podcast, go to all seminars, just get educated. There's so much information out there. Hang out with the right people. Yeah, there's always deals. You've got to be playing or else you'll just get withered up. But you don't have to be aggressive right now. Yeah. So I think we're bullish in the long run. America is going to be the greatest you know, investment opportunity for real estate always is today. The best time was yesterday. The second best time is today. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Okay, so tell us quickly about some morning habits. Because I this morning routine is a big topic of conversation the last few years. We had Al, Al Rod on the show before. You know, you wrote Miracle Morning Millionaires. Yeah, so Hal and I are good buds. He lives 200 yards from my house. My kids and his kids are best buds. But Hal, when I met him, I was already a morning guy, but I wasn't. I didn't have the six steps. And so the reason I agreed to write Miracle Morning Millionaires with him was he's already written the Miracle Morning, which is a great way for people that haven't started before to shake off the rust and start living a life of abundance and choosing their destiny. I just tweaked it a little bit for what it's like to be a multimillionaire. So instead of just doing the visualization he described, what I visualize is my appointments going well, my staff working well. I'll, I'll just do this like one hour morning routine where I exercise, I read, I read my Peloton before our call here. I journal, I um, give myself some affirmations. I'm not great at affirmations. I'm just usually like, I'm going to be present to my kids today. I'm going to be a great husband today. I'm going to be uh, attentive to my team today. The difference with the millionaire piece is really, I think the difference between successful people and, and non-successful people is successful people are always purposeful. They always have a purpose. And so it's to think about your purpose in the morning, right? Visualize where you see yourself going. Because in life, we tend to get what we expect. And if you don't expect anything, then you get what you get and you don't get to throw a fit. Using the power of the morning to set your day. If you win the morning, you win the day. I'd already been living that, but Hal had such a beautiful, complete, simple system that I integrated my life into. And my favorite deal is to get up at 5 a.m., head to my library and sit there and for one hour, just go through these six steps. And if I get them done, well, the exercise, I have to go to my exercise room. But if I get them done, my day is always better than the days I don't. So today's going to be an amazing day because it's, what, 8 o'clock here or 9 o'clock, and I've already just done so much to set up my day for success. Right. There's no question if you don't do anything else, just go to bed early and get up early. There's a reason for that old saying, early to bed, early to rise, makes a person healthy, wealthy, and wise. It is so true. You just got to gotta beat the world in getting up and just then you feel like you own the day, right? Yeah, you only have the morning really to be productive. You know, by 11 o'clock, the world starts coming back at you. Whatever you've created that day, the rest of it's just reactionary mode. So, mm-hmm. And I used to be the opposite. I used to think l- working late was smart, and I used to sleep later. I was 100% wrong. I am so much more productive now between the hours of 5 a.m. and 7 a.m. than I, I ever was when I was staying up till midnight. I agree. I love getting up early. David, give out your website. DavidOsborne.com. If you just go to www.DavidOsborne.com, you can find all about me there or go by Wealth Can't Wait at Amazon. David, thanks for joining us. Great to be with you. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own. And if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go Go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.